that. Good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14? You should have my translation to 2 Timothy chapter 3 in front of you. We're going to wrap up our study of verse 15 here this evening, where Paul, uh, we're going to note the part of the verse where Paul describes the Old Testament in relation to Timothy experiencing salvation. So uh, we're going to have a, a lot to say about uh, salvation here this evening, as well as um, wisdom, because wisdom is mentioned here. And also we're going to have uh, a, a little bit of, uh, we'll mention, of course, uh, the impact of uh, Timothy's uh, grandmother and mother upon uh, his life and his, uh, his walk with God and his understanding of the Old Testament. We'll talk about the Old Testament in relation to Timothy experiencing salvation. Of course, also, we'll see uh, that uh, in this verse that Timothy needs to, if he's going to experience his salvation, he needs to appropriate by faith his union and identification with Christ. So we've talked about that in relation to sanctification, and we'll talk about that, and we've talked about it in relation to salvation. We're going to talk about it again here this evening. So we have a lot of ground to cover, and so with that in mind, let's take a moment of silent prayers as our custom. We do this to, to examine ourselves to see if we need to confess any sins to the Father. Father, when we do that, when we do that, we're restored to fellowship with God, and fellowship with God is maintained by bringing our thoughts into obedience to what the Spirit says to us through the teaching of the Word of God, which He's inspired. That's when we're obeying the command of Ephesians 5:18 to be filled with the Spirit, and that simply means that we're being influenced by the Holy Spirit, and He does that when we obey His teaching, which He's inspired in the Scriptures. So, uh, with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this day that you've graciously given to us to study your word. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that he would do a mighty work through all of us here this evening, both the communicator and those in the audience. We just thank you, Father, for the things that we're learning in 2 Timothy. And we pray, Father, that the, the Spirit would uh, empower the communicator to accurately teach your word. And also that he would uh, give understanding to the audience to understand what's being taught and help them to apply what they're learning. We pray that both the communicator and the audience would be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction. And we pray, Father, that this uh, lesson would bear fruit in the lives of your people. And we pray for this in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Should be at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, and I'm reading from the New American Standard. Paul says to Timothy, you, however, and that's, as we pointed out in my translation, in contrast to the apostate past the teachers in his day, which are described in verse 13, and also verses 6 through 9 of the same chapter, he says, you, however, Timothy, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now in verse 14, just a very brief review, in verse 14 we see when he says, you however, Timothy, continue in the things you have learned. Uh, that speaks of the, the things that he has learned is that teaching, as we pointed out, there's a date of, of standard in there uh, uh, in that passage with the prepositional, uh, preposition N, and uh, we see that it, uh, it, and the object of which is host, in the plural form, which translated, translated things. What he's actually saying is that I want you to continue to make it your habit of adhering adhering to or uh, continuing to conform to the standard of those things, that the teachings that you've learned through instruction and observation. So he's saying that uh, the, when it says in the things, it, mean, it means it talks about the, uh, the teachings that he received and the teachings which he received from his mother and his grandmother and Paul reveal a particular standard of living or a particular code of conduct for the Christian. To, in order to live a godly life. So that's what he's saying there, as we pointed out in previous classes. Then he says, he advances upon that, he says, you became convinced of. That talks about conviction. And he got the conviction because he saw Paul, 
he saw his mother and his grandmother put the word of God into practice in their life. And this gave Timothy, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the conviction that what they were teaching him, whether it was his mother and grandmother in the Old Testament when he was a kid, and Paul as an adult teaching him the gospel, he recognized, he could see through their lives, and they're practicing what they taught him, he, became, he came to the conviction that what they were teaching him was truth. Why would he come to that conviction? Because he saw truth working in their lives. And this gave him, this, this, through the Spirit, this ministry, it gave him the conviction that, yes, I want to learn, I want to be a, a, a faithful uh, uh, to the Word of God. I want to learn the Word of God. I want to put it into practice. I want, in other words, I want to do the will of God. And he learned it and got that conviction from his pe- mother and his grandmother, as well as Paul. And then he says, it says, knowing from whom you have learned them, that actually is a, that's a causal idea, means you, have, you came convinced of these things, that you learn from me and Paul says, and also your mother and grandmother, you became convinced of these things because you knew from whom you have learned these things. And he learned from whom, speaking of Paul, his mother and his grandmother. So he, 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 because he, he, he kept this conviction because he knew for certain where he learned these things. He learned them from Paul and his mother and his grandmother. And then in verse 15, he advances upon that. He says, and that from childhood, you have known the sacred writings. Uh, as we saw last evening, the word that is translating hoti, which is actually a causal idea here. How do I know that? Because uh, we're comparing uh, clauses with clauses. You can see the causal idea. So instead of that, we can say, and, or yes, instead of and, that's emphatic, and, and, and yes, from, because from childhood, you have known the sacred writings. So as we saw last evening, this is very important. And the causal clause at the end of verse 14, because knowing from whom you've learned them, that's ambiguous because we, he's not uh, yet told us who the whom is. We can obviously see Paul is one of those people because of what he said in verses 10 and 11. But who are these other people? Well, the next statement, the next causal clause, because from childhood you've known the sacred writings, the reference to childhood would Obviously, Paul would say, oh, you're referring to my mother and my grandmother. And if you compare 2 Timothy 1.5 with what he says here in verse 15, we know he's talking about he learned from his mother and his grandmother the Old Testament scriptures. Then he says about the Old Testament scriptures, which is uh, uh, described by Paul as the sacred writings. He says that they're able to give you, Timothy, the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, there's a couple of things we need to bring up. And we'll see this when we get into 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, which, uh, which I'm working on right now. Actually, we're going tomorrow. But we're going to see that there's a strong possibility, and I think a lot of scholars uh, believe this as well. When Paul talks about the sacred writings, no doubt we know it's the Old Testament. But he could also be referring also to his letters, because Paul... Uh, kept a, a, a bundle of his letters, everything he published, he kept for himself. And that was not unusual for philosophers in the ancient world, some men like that, like Paul, religious leaders, to do that. So this could, could, you wouldn't be uh, far from the truth, I think. When he talks about the sacred writings, he also could be talking about his own epistles that he wrote. And what's interesting, I can't wait till we get to 2 Timothy 4.13 and talk about this. And we could have pro- brought it, probably brought this out when we did canonicity and, uh, uh, and, and uh, undoubtedly or basics of New Testament textual criticism. I think I might have touched on it. But Paul was the one, uh, Timothy, more than Luke, because Luke was around Paul quite a bit, as we can see. Uh, 2 Timothy 4.12 mentions that. Um, and he, you see him a lot in Paul's epistles as you know, passing along his greetings with Paul to the people they're writing to. Well, Timothy, more than likely, I believe, was the one who put Paul's letters together. Well, after Paul died, I think Timothy was, uh, was the guy that he, because uh, he was with, he was actually, uh, when he was writing to these different churches, he's in the salutations of many of these letters to the churches. I believe Timothy was uh, basically the custodian uh, the guardian of Paul's writings. And that's why, and they, 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 from the, the earliest writings, the, 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 the writings that were accepted by the church as, as uh, canonical were Paul's writings. So I believe that if we talk about sacred writings here, maybe Paul, could strong possibly that Paul's also referring to his writings. We know it's the Old Testament for sure. 
but uh, uh, actually, uh, I stand corrected here. From childhood, obviously, when he says childhood, he's referencing the Old Testament. I'm mixing things here. When he says from childhood, that would say it references his mother in 2 Timothy 1.5 and his grandmother teaching him the Old Testament scriptures. The, uh, the New Testament writings hadn't come about when he was a kid, obviously. So what I'm talking about in 2 Timothy 4.13, where Paul talks about bring my parchments and whatnot, that, those parchments were, were, were also not just the Old Testament scriptures, but t Paul's writing. So I was mixing what I was, had, uh, what I was studying uh, t today and what I'm going to be studying tomorrow. But here we have the very importance, the importance of the Old Testament scriptures. It's interesting. Uh, there's, I think there's a guy named John MacArthur. The guy named, uh, John, uh, I know a guy named John MacArthur. He's a famous teacher, but he also has uh, come up, he's got, he's got a lot of great stuff, but he comes up with this Lordship salvation thing, which is very bad. Now, what's interesting about him, I've heard about him, he doesn't teach the Old Testament. And that's not right, I'm sorry. Uh, the apostles, the early church, their Bibles was, because their, most people didn't speak Hebrew, was their translation they worked off was the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And that's what Paul taught the Gentile churches with, and that's what, he, that's what the other apostles did as well, because the Gentiles didn't know Hebrew. Okay, so they knew Greek. So that's what they, they used as a translation. So uh, they learned, and of course, what's great about Paul, and the, uh, especially Paul, because he was a rabbi, he knew the, the Hebrew, and uh, so he could, uh, he, and so did Jesus, obviously, but uh, he could uh, go and he could go back to the original Hebrew and, tw and, and tweak a translation from the Septuagint if he needed to, if it wasn't as uh, accurate enough. So what uh, we have here is the importance of the Old Testament. And what I'm saying here to you now, in, uh, with reference to the MacArthur not teaching the Old Testament, uh, we should, as pastors, we should be teaching both New and Old Testament. If you notice with me, I go, old te like for instance, on our weekday classes, we just finished Daniel. We did almost three, almost three years of Daniel. We did all 12 chapters, verse by verse, everything. Then we stopped that. After we finished that, we went over and did a little thing on bibliology for a month or two. Then we got into 2 Timothy, we went back to the New Testament. And uh, so in our, in our, I think in our Sunday classes, I actually went to a bunch of uh, smaller epistles in the New Testament, but once we finish Col Colossians, we'll probably go back into the Old Testament again and maybe do the Book of Ruth or something like that. So before we, I might, might, I might uh, not do, I don't want to do a big, big book right now. I want to knock off some of these smaller ones as I've been pointing out to you in, in, in times past. So the Old Testament and the New Testament, we should be teaching them both. And the early church, that was their Bible, the Old Testament, and along accompanied by the apostles' teaching. So the apostles' teaching, as I pointed out in Canonicity, I think, and, and uh, I pointed out last evening, uh, the New Testament writings, the earliest writings that were accepted by the church as canonical were Paul's writings. I think James is the other, was one of the early ones. Uh, but we also see the John's writings, like Revelation, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Uh, the Gospel of John, were all written in the, in the final decade of the first century, most scholars believe. Uh, and the Synoptic Gospels, that mean, they're synoptic because they share a lot of the same information. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all were, those three were, were published around the 60s of the first century. So, and, so that's what we have here, is that the, uh, the New Testament writings were in the process when Paul wrote 2 Timothy, they were in the process of being written the New Testament scriptures. So the apostles would go and they'd have the revelation that they were given, the gospel they were given, and they'd communicate it to the churches along with the Old Testament. In fact, it's very important that we do both because, uh, and we're probably going to do a study between books about this, it's important to see that the New Testament fulfills the Old Testament. Uh, the New Testament doesn't make sense without the Old Testament. The Old Testament doesn't make sense without the New Testament. They go together because all the promise, all the all the, uh, the promises of the Old Testament are fulfilled are yes in Jesus, and Jesus is presented in the Gospel, which is in our New Testament. So it's very important we get a good background of these things. And it's, for those of you who've studied um, Genesis and Romans with me, uh, remember we did Genesis and then we did all fifty chapters. Then we went to Romans, and there was a lot of stuff. Uh, quoted, or there was stuff quoted from Genesis, or not even directly quoted, but alluded to, like the fall, and stuff like that, and creation. We had studied all that, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we studied all of that, and when we get to Romans, Paul is mentioning a lot of these characters and things in the book of Romans. So you could see that the New Testament writers, like Paul, obviously, 
they worked off the old the old testament text and uh, and well they should because of the promises of the messiah G that jesus filled are found in the old testament so he's mention he's mentioning here that uh, if you compare this with 2 Timothy 1.5, Paul's statement in 2 Timothy 3.15, you compare it with 2 Timothy 1.5, as we saw last evening and times past, the, the mention of his childhood, Timothy's childhood in verse 15, uh, is uh, alluding to his mother and grandmother if we compare this statement with what he says in 2 Timothy 1.5. So that his mother and his grandmother are instrumental in his growth as a believer. They gave him a firm foundation in the Old Testament, which is perfect, because when the gospel came around, Timothy was so much ahead of the crowd of, Gen of Gentiles. Uh, he would be considered Jewish because his mother was Jewish. But the, the, the churches that he was in, the church he was in, like in Lystra, you know, Derby, those places in, in his era, they were primarily Gentile. And so he was, when he was in those churches, he knew a lot more about the Bible than anybody else because of his background. And he had a, he had a really firm appreciation for Jesus and the gospel and what he did and his death and resurrection, and because in the, the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled as the Jewish Messiah, Timothy had a great advantage over that because he knew those promises in the Old Testament of Messiah and the promises to Israel. So that gave him a greater understanding of the gospel. In fact, Paul mentions in Romans chapter 1, the law and the prophets. Well, he's saying his gospel is in accordance with the law and the prophets, which is a designation commonly used in the first century for the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets. And so this is, uh, this is very important. So it's telling us that what we should learn is the Old Testament is just as important as, we, as the New Testament. We need both. We need that balance. So he's mentioning he, them here in verse 15. So he says that the Old Testament scriptures, the sacred writings, are able to give Timothy the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, which is a, a lot being said there. Uh, first of all, the word, uh, the phrase, are able, uh, that's translating the verb dunamai, and then the word for you is the personal pronoun su, and that's, of course, referring to Timothy. And then the word for, to give, for translated to give wisdom is sophizo. Now, the word dunamai, translated are able, it speaks of, of power, really. It speaks of the capacity or the ability to do something or to have the power to do something. So here, it denotes that the Old Testament scriptures are able or have the power or have the ability to give Timothy wisdom which leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now the present tense of this verb, dunamai, is what we call a gnomic present and that's used, uh, a gnomic present is used to make a statement of a general timeless fact. So that would indicate that the Old Testament scriptures are, we could say, as an eternal spiritual truth, able to give Timothy wisdom for the purpose of experiencing salvation. So this verb translated to, uh, to give wisdom, sophizo, sophizo, it's in the infinitive form. It pertains to causing a person to have wisdom and understanding. So here, again, it denotes that the Old Testament scriptures, the sacred writings, are able to give Timothy are able to impart to him or give wisdom to him in the sense that they can cause Timothy to de develop an understanding to a relatively sophisticated degree for the purpose of experiencing salvation. So that's what he's saying here with the phrase, which are able to give you wisdom. He's saying that the Old Testament scriptures have the power the ability to give you, impart to you, cause you to have wisdom. Then he keeps, we keep going. A key phrase, it's a prepositional phrase, that leads to salvation. So there's a purpose for these, learning these Old Testament scriptures and the ability for the scriptures to give you wisdom. It gives you wisdom in relation to what? For the purpose of experiencing salvation. That's what the phrase that leads to salvation is referring to. The word for salvation is the word uh, uh, soter uh, soteria, and this word uh, soteria, excuse me, Soteria is a word that's translated salvation. It means deliverance, salvation. When you think of this word salvation, think of deliverance. But what is it speaking of? Deliverance from what? What do we save from? We talk up to people, we're saved. Saved from what? Be amazed how many Christians don't even know what they're saved from. You say, first of all, if you think about eternal condemnation, lake of fire, you're, 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 you're delivered from your sins. You're delivered from the sin nature. You're delivered from Satan's kingdom. 
We saw that in Ephesians 1.13. You're delivered from uh, Satan's cosmic system, his kingdom. You're also delivered from physical and, per, and, and spiritual death. You're delivered from condemnation from the law because the law condemns us. So you're delivered from all those things. That's what salvation is speaking of. How that happened? Jesus' death and resurrection delivered us from all those things that we were in, 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 uh, that were against us when we were under the headship of Adam, the, who fell in the Garden of Eden. So the word uh, soteria, it means deliverance, salvation. It's used with reference, of course, to Timothy. And it contains what we call the figure of metonymy. That simply means that salvation is put here for experiencing salvation. That's obvious here, as I'll point out to you. Uh, he's not talking about, Timothy's already saved, is he not? Yes. So it's not talking about entering, getting saved, justification. Justification already happened for Timothy years ago. What is Timothy's already a Christian? So this salvation, these Old Testament scriptures can't be talking about salvation in a perfective sense at the rapture of the church when Timothy gets a resurrection body like the rest of us Christians because the scriptures are not used for that. Jesus with his omnipotence does that. So he's got to be talking about, because of the mention of the Old Testament here, he's got to be talking about Timothy experiencing his salvation. As we pointed out, like sanctification, uh, salvation comes in three stages. But, uh, we have, first of all, positional. Then we have experiential. Then we have the perfective, the ultimate sense of sa sa salvation. What's, pro what's uh, positional? It, think of positional. It's something that took place in the past at the moment of your justification when you became a Christian through faith in Jesus Christ. Positional means this is how God views you and what he's done for you. In relation to salvation, that means Jesus' death and resurrection delivered us from eternal condemnation, condemnation from the law, physical and spiritual death, personal sins, Satan and his kingdom, all those things. In a positional sense, that's what God has done for you, and that's how he views you and I. Perfective means we're, com we're going to be permanently delivered from all these things, meaning we'll always have fellowship, we'll always experience this deliverance from those things when we get a resurrection body, because we'll be minus a sin nature. Now we're in between. We, a lot of scholars call it not ready, uh, already but not yet, because we're in between the two, or the two stages. Now we have to make decisions, a decision to have fellowship with God if we're going to experience this salvation, this deliverance from all these things in time. Enjoy it now. So that's what he's talking about here when he uses the phrase that, the phrase that leads to salvation. He's talking about the experiential aspect of Timothy's salvation, experiencing it. Now, very important, uh, the, fr the word that, it's translated, or that leads to. They're translating, that, those three words by, that the New American Standard uses are used to translation, translate the preposition ace. And here, I, don't, uh, it's, I suppose it's got a purpose in, in the idea there, but I wouldn't translate it the way they do. I think it's rather ambiguous. And uh, actually, I don't think it... Uh, I don't think it's a, it, it's a correct, a, a very good translation for the simple reason because it makes it sound like Timothy hasn't got saved yet. He obviously is, is saved. Unless you, unless they understand it as being experiencing your salvation, I still don't like it. The preposition uh, uh, ace is, uh, should be, a, it's a marker of purpose. Simply, it indicates that the prep, this prepositional phrase is presenting the purpose for which the Old Testament is able to give Timothy wisdom. Let me show you how, my, way I would translate it is a lot better than the New American uh, Standard. Look at it, how I translate it. Uh, the sacred writings, the middle of verse 15, which are able to give you the wisdom for the purpose of experiencing salvation, which is through faith, which, uh, through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So, the, uh, the, that phrase that leads to salvation, I would translate it for the purpose of, of experiencing salvation. Then we have, if, we're gonna if Timothy's going to experience salvation, he has to exercise faith. So the phrase through faith is talking about, it's an instrumental idea. It's speaking of the fact that faith, appropriating by faith his, Timothy's union identification with Christ, is going to enable him to experience that salvation. And I'll show you how the Old Testament scriptures tie into this for Timothy. So through faith, the word faith is pistis. You probably remember that. We've used, seen it a lot in Paul's writings and in John's. Uh, the word pistis, faith, is used in an active sense, referring to Timothy's 
post-conversion faith in the word of God and specifically the Old Testament because that's what he's talking about in context Paul is and it also speaks of Paul's faith in Paul's apostolic teaching because Timothy was already declared justified through faith in Jesus Christ so is Timothy a believer yes so this faith can't be faith to get saved, you know, become justified, declared justified, to enter into God's family and be a child of God. No, it's talking about faith that takes place after your conversion. You have faith in the word of God. Remember, we, uh, Paul talked about this in Romans. Uh, you know, we have from faith to faith, that, that expression that we see in Romans 1, 16 and 17, it, your, your faith, you, you have faith at the moment, of, it takes one decision, one uh, to exercise faith in Jesus Christ, to get declared justified, to get enter into God's family, to receive the forgiveness of sins. And then, after you get into God's family, it says in, in Romans 1.17, the righteous man shall live by faith. Now, only a believer is righteous, because he has imputed righteousness. The non-Christian doesn't have the imputed righteousness of Christ. So therefore, we as Christians who are righteous, declared righteous through faith in Jesus Christ at justification, are to, experience, are to exercise faith in God's word. And for Timothy, who is a new, new covenant believer, New Testament believer like you and I, a church age believer, this faith has an object, and the object for us after conversion is our union and identification with Christ in his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session. So this word peace, these again, is used in an active sense, referring to Timothy's post-conversion faith in the word of God, and specifically the Old Testament, and Paul's apostolic teaching. Why? Because Timothy was already declared justified through faith in Jesus Christ. Now this word faith, pistis, it's the object of the preposition dia, which is functioning here as a marker of means. So the, the phrase, or the word through, is an English word that conveys that idea. You could translate it by means of, they get the same idea across. So this would indicate that the Old Testament scriptures are able to give Timothy wisdom for the purpose of his, of his experiencing his salvation by means of faith, in his union and identification with Jesus Christ. So, with union identification with Christ, that's met, uh, referred to in the last phrase, which is in Christ Jesus. It's alluding to Timothy's union and identification with Christ and his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session. How do I know that? Because he's talking about Timothy experiencing salvation. Okay? So, the object to get, if you're a non Christian, the object of your faith is Jesus Christ. Now that you're in God's family, you're already, you become a Christian through faith in Jesus Christ. The object of your faith is your union and identification with Christ. And that's alluded to in John's, Jesus' vine and the branches metaphor in John 15. Paul mentions it all through his writings. Every time you see in Christ, in Christ Jesus, in him, that's all alluding in some form or fashion to this union and identification with Christ. So, uh, the phrase, which is in Christ Jesus, uh, the, uh, uh, is speaking of that. Now, the word for Christ, very familiar word we've seen in the past, Christos. It's a technical word designating the humanity of our Lord as the promised Savior of all mankind, and uh, who is unique as the incarnate Son of God, and com who is totally, also totally and completely guided and empowered by the Spirit as the servant of the Father. Now, this word contains a figure of metonymy as well, meaning that the person of Christ is put for Timothy's union and identification with him and his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session at the right hand of the Father. So, what, so again, as I said before, if we're talking about the non-Christian, the object of his faith has got to be Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, and the work of Jesus Christ. Believe in him, and you're saved. Well, now that you're in God's family, what's Christ Jesus in Christ Jesus referring to? It's got to be referring to Timothy's union identification with Christ and his death and resurrection. He's, telling, he's saying here that, Timothy, you experience salvation by appropriating by faith your union and identification with Christ. Paul did that, I've mentioned this many times, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, not I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live I, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Live by faith in the Son of God? Well, he already said, I'm crucified with Christ. That means I'm, when he says, I live by faith in, in, in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up to me, he means I appropriate by faith my position with Christ. And again, John, Jesus in the vine and the branches metaphor, 
mentions this union and identification with himself, with believers, church age believers. I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide me. Without me, you can do nothing. So this, uh, this word Christos, Christ, it's the object of the preposition N, which is a marker of a close personal association, and you could translate it in union with. And the word for Jesus, Jesus, it uh, stands in apposition to the word Christos, Christ. When that happens, apposition, it simply means that Jesus, Jesus, is clarifying for the reader that Jesus is the Christ. Now, why would he have to do this? Well, in the first century, there were many messiahs. Many people claimed they're the messiah, that they're the Christ. So when Paul says the Christ, in Christ, he's saying, who is Jesus? Because he's being specific. It's Jesus of Nazareth is the one who is the messiah, the Christ. Now, with that being said, now, we had to go back to the original languages because you would... Uh, if you really want to understand this passage, we had to do that and tweak the translation, so to speak, to bring this stuff out, as you'll see in my translation of verse 15. So look at 2 Timothy 3.14 in my translation, please. 2 Timothy 3.14. You, however, in contrast to them, the apostate pastor teaches, described in verse 13 and also verses 6 through 9, continue to make it your habit of conforming to the standard of those things, those things referring to the teachings he received from his mother, grandmother, and Paul, which you have learned through instruction and observation. You, the standard of speaking the way a godly person is supposed to live, the, stand, uh, the, the code of conduct. So he learned these, the code of conduct, how a godly person is to live, a Christian is supposed to live, by the things he learned and observed through his mother, grandmother, and Paul. He learned and observed from watching their example of putting their teaching into practice. What they taught him, they put into practice. So that's what he's referring to. So again, you, however, in contrast to them, continue to make it your habit of conforming to the standard of those things which you have learned through instruction and observation, indeed, have become convinced of, because you certainly know from whom you have learned through instruction and observation. Yes, because from childhood, you certainly know the Holy Scriptures, Old Testament, which are able to give you the wisdom for the, give you wisdom for the purpose of experiencing salvation by means of faith in your union and identification with the Christ who is Jesus. So here we see in verse 15, Paul goes on to assert that the Old Testament Scriptures are able to give Timothy wisdom. They're able to give, uh, impart or give wisdom to Timothy in what sense? In the sense that they can cause him to develop understanding to a relatively sophisticated degree for the purpose of experiencing salvation. The Old Testament, he's saying, what you learn in the Old Testament from your mother and your grandmother and what you hear me teach, they give you wisdom in, order, in, in, in relation to experiencing your salvation. And we're going to talk about in what sense do they give him, what does the Old Testament give Timothy that's going to help him experience his salvation? What's going to help him to appropriate by faith his union and identification with Christ? Well, there's many examples in the Old Testament of believers like Daniel we studied and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego where their faith in the Lord appropriated the omnipotence of God to deliver them. This is what we've seen in the Old Testament. So that's why the Old Testament scriptures would be an aid to Timothy and him experiencing salvation because they would give him examples of believers like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who, and David, who appropriated God's power to deliver them from adversity. It, it, it showed them examples of faith. It showed Timothy examples of faith in, these, in, the, in the lives of these men. So uh, Paul is saying here that the this Old Testament scriptures are able to impart, Timothy, impart to Timothy wisdom in the sense that they can cause him to develop understanding, to develop an understanding to a relatively sophisticated degree for the purpose of his experiencing his salvation. Paul then presents the purpose for which the Old Testament is able to give t wisdom to Timothy. The scriptures are able to give wisdom to Timothy in order that he can have the capacity to experience salvation or his deliverance from sin and Satan and his cosmic system. So wisdom is being used here and the Old Testament scriptures give you wisdom to, so that, uh, to help you in experiencing your salvation. 
Now, wisdom, what is wisdom? Well, obviously, it's in the mind and thinking of God. Wisdom is basically, when we have it, it's the, it's the application of the word of God. It's the application of doctrine. Sophia is the word in the Greek, the word for wisdom. Now, it's the ability or the, know, uh, the, the, the ability and the know-how to do things God's way. So when we learn the scriptures, we're getting wisdom from God. God's word teaches us how to be a good mother, a good, in God's eyes, a good father, a good child, a good parent, a good pastor, a good Christian. It teaches you how to bring glory to God. It teaches you what the will of God is. It gives you wisdom to do things, ability. It gives you the, uh, the ability to know how to do things God's way. And that's what we learn, one of the reasons why we learn God's word. The other ultimately is to worship him. So the, we see understanding that Timothy is already a believer is critical to understanding how Paul is using this word salvation here in verse 15, as I pointed out. Therefore, since Timothy is already a, a believer, salvation here refers to him experiencing the deliverance from personal sins, the sin nature, Satan, his cosmic system, condemnation from the law, spiritual and physical death, and of course, eternal condemnation. Now, this deliverance was accomplished through cru the crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session of the Lord Jesus Christ, and which deliverance was appropriated by the Holy Spirit for Timothy at the moment of his conversion, at the moment of justification. So here's Jesus. He dies on the cross, and he rises from the dead, and sits right here in the Father. He is now the new humanity. He's the, as we saw in Colossians, he is the head of this new humanity. The old humanity was under Adam. That's where we were, condemned before a holy God. Now, through faith in Jesus Christ, resulting in our justification, we're under the headship of Jesus Christ, the place of blessing, not under cursing, where we were under Adam, under his headship. So we have this deliverance. And again, what, what, what was against us? You read the book of Romans, eternal condemnation. God's holy, we're sinners. Uh, we had uh, physical death. Physical death, spiritual death came into the human race because of Adam's sin. Uh, we have a sin nature because of Adam's sin in the garden. Romans, uh, Romans 5.12. So we have that to be delivered from. We're, uh, we're under bondage to Satan and his cosmic system. We're under that. We're condemned by the law. God's law demands perfection. We can't meet it. So all these things are stacked against us. Jesus came to deliver us from all that. And his crucifixion, his death, burial, resurrection, and session of the right hand of the Father delivered us from those things. Now, when you and I trusted in Jesus Christ as our Savior at the moment of justification, like Timothy, the Holy Spirit appropriated, took possession for us, that, that deliverance from all these things. Now, we have this possession, we get deliverance from all these things, and we got, a, we got a guarantee of being perfected in a resurrection body and then permanently delivered from these things. Well, now when we have faith in God's word, and particularly we, we appropriate by faith our position in Christ, our union and identification with Christ, and consider ourselves dead to the sin nature and alive to God because we've died with Christ and we're raised with Christ, we're now appropriating for ourselves by faith that deliverance that was given, that appropriated for us by the Spirit. So we have here that, that Timothy is already a believer. So when we talk about salvation here, it's talking about the experiential aspect of salvation. So let me uh, show you this uh, sal salvation in these stages. Um, look at, uh, hold your place. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. Let's start there. Look at Ephesians 1, 13. All right. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse 13. In him, that's speaking of Christ, in him, because of a union and identification with Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so there, verse 13, is basically saying that it was through faith in Christ 
that justification that you have to see, because he says, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So that's talking about the positional aspect of this, of this salvation and sanctification. How do we know that? Because he's talking about something that took place in the past. And these people are right, that he's writing to are Christians. So it's got to be talking about the positional aspect of their salvation and sanctification when they do, meaning the moment of justification, the minute you became a Christian. Okay? So that's the positional aspect. Now, I want, you to, I want to show you the perfective aspect in a resurrection body. Look at Romans 13. Look at verse 10, Romans 13, 10. So when you see the word salvation or saved, don't cookie cut the word and just think, oh, that's when I became a Christian. Or when, he, when somebody becomes a Christian. No, it doesn't always mean that. Look at Romans 13, 10. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Do this. Love your neighbor as yourself, knowing the time that is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. Now salvation, because it's speaking of something in the future, has to be talking about the perfective aspect of a salvation when we get our resurrection body. Because these people he's writing to are already believers. In fact, he's already affirmed that he and his, riot, his readers have already believed. So, that's the perfective aspect in a resurrection body. Now look at 1 Corinthians. You got Romans. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse 1. And there's a passage, I can't, I don't have time to bring it to you there, but um, Warren Worsby brings this out in his commentary somewhere. But uh, Hebrews 9 talks about all three categories, all, all three um, stages of salvation in, in, that, in that chapter of Hebrews. Chapter, Hebrews chapter 9. <clears throat> Look at 1 Corinthians 15.1. Now, now who's he writing to? Believers. Corinthian church. Now I make known to you, brethren, the, see his brethren, they're, they're believers. So that's important. That means they're already, they've already saved in a positional sense. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you. Notice the past tenses which also you receive. See, they became Christians. So they, they've exp they have the positional aspect of their salvation. And which also you stand. That speaks of eternal security. Then he says, by which gospel you are also are saved. Note the present, tent, you, present tense. You are saved. So by the gospel, they're, they're experiencing their salvation. That's what he's referring to. That's, who, that's the, uh, what he's doing with Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15. He's, he's talking about the experiential aspect of their salvation. In other words, fellowship with God. By which also, gospel, you are saved. Present tense is the experiential aspect of salvation. And here's the condition attached to it. If you hold fast the word. If you're doing what I teach you, if you obey the gospel I've taught you, you, will experiencing, you are experiencing your salvation. That's what he's saying. And then he goes on to say, which I, I preach to you unless you believed in vain. So there we have the, uh, Paul is, is speaking in verse 2 of the experiential aspect of salvation. And that's what he's referring to in 2 Timothy 3.15 when he's talking to Timothy, Paul is. So go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, please. Verse 15. So, the baptism of the Spirit at Timothy's conversion, and this is true of all Christians, identified Timothy with Jesus Christ in his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session. Thus, he is positionally identified with Jesus Christ in his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session, and this provides him the guarantee of being perfected in a resurrection body. It's a guarantee, all believers. And it sets up the potential for Timothy to experience this deliverance in time prior to being perfected. I say potential because it demands faith in order to experience your salvation. So, Timothy, and this is true of us, can experience this deliverance by appropriating by faith his union and identification with Jesus Christ, which is accomplished by Timothy considering himself dead to the sin nature and alive to God. Why? Because he's, he's been 
because of the baptism of the Spirit, he's died with Christ and he's raised with Christ. That's why he's, we're supposed to consider ourselves dead to the sin nature and alive to God. Meaning, sin has no more power over us. We don't need to sin. We're not slaves to sin anymore. God is, through Christ, has released us, our volitions, from the bondage to sin. We are always obeying that sin nature in the devil. Now, because we're Christians and we're identified with Christ and we have a new nature in the Spirit and the, and the Son and the Father and dwell us, we have the capacity now to say no to sin. We don't have to experience that uh, being in bondage to sin. We've been delivered. So it's a question of will we agree with what God's telling us? Will we have faith in what he's done for us? And that, if we do, we will experience our salvation. And similarly, when you're experiencing salvation and sanctification, that's, uh, that's two different ways of speaking of fellowship. This is a lot of Christians don't get this because they're not getting taught this stuff. It's really bad. And even some seminaries, they don't even get this. They're not getting this straight. When we experience our salvation and sanctification, that's, those are terms for fellowship. Fellowship can be described as experiencing our salvation. It's speaking of fellowship from the perspective that we're experiencing our deliverance from sin and Satan. Sa experiencing our sanctification. It describes fellowship from the perspective that we're experiencing the fact that we're set apart to serve God exclusively. And that's where we gotta, we got to tie these things together and see how the, these things all fit together. It's really not rocket science. You just pay attention to what the teaching is and you'll get this. So this is very important for us. And this, this is what helped me a lot in my walk with God, knowing this stuff. Now the Old Testament scriptures would provide Timothy... And this is one that's very important to understand. How is the Old Testament helping Timothy to experience his salvation, which is accomplished by means of appropriating by faith his union and identification with Christ? How is the scriptures related to this? We're going to talk about that. The Old Testament scriptures would provide Timothy many examples of Old Testament saints who appropriated the power or omnipotence of God to experience Deliverance from their enemies. Isn't Paul talking to Timothy about experiencing deliverance, salvation through faith? Right. So the Old Testament gives us many examples of men like Daniel, men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who appropriated God's power through faith. They had faith in the Lord. So Timothy is to follow their example. And the, the Hebrew, Hebrews 11, the Hall of Fame of Faith, all those people are Old Testament saints people. So this is what we got going on here. Faith has many examples of faith in the Old Testament. And this is Timothy, the benefit of Timothy knowing his Old Testament. He can always go back and learn from these guys how they exercise faith. Because this will help him in exercising faith in his union and with his union and identification with Christ. So by appropriating by faith, his union and identification with Jesus Christ. Timothy would appropriate the power of God in his life and thus be able to experience his deliverance or salvation in time prior to being perfected in a resurrection body. Now, don't miss this. Some of you are probably thinking, when am I going to experience the power of God in my life? What did you, I say in the class? And many times. When you trusted in Jesus, the Holy Spirit identified you with Christ. And his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session. That marriage or union to Christ, that identification, is God's power. He delivered us from sin, Satan, cosmic system, personal sins, physical death, spiritual death, condemnation of the law. He delivered us. That's power. God's power is in Jesus' death and resurrection and delivered us from all those things. So every time you have fellowship with God, you're experiencing God's power. You've appropriated God's power. Every time you have faith in God's word, and you, let's say in relation to sin, you say, I consider myself dead to the sin nature and alive to God because I've died with Christ and I'm raised with Christ. And you do that, you've appropriated God's power, and now you're experiencing God's power and deliverance from all those things I mentioned earlier in your life. You're experiencing the power of God. When you take up the shield of faith, take up the full armor of God, Ephesians 6, that's another metaphor describing in military terms the Christian's union identification with Christ. He's our righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness is imputed righteousness of Christ. He's the truth, the belt, the truth. <laughs> All these things are related to our union and identification with Christ because Jesus is the truth. 
you know, the, the, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, the b combat boots of the gospel, gospel, the helmet of salvation. All these things are related to Christ in some way and our, our, our position with him. So very important. I think it's very exciting to know that God's power can be working in our lives and will be working in our lives when we're having fellowship with him, when we're obeying his word. Faith produces obedience to God's commands, and when we're doing that, we're appropriating God's power because God's po word is power. So let's put it, let me give you, break it down even further. The non-Christians that you know, they are enslaved to sin and Satan, the Bible says. They have no hope of living apart from being in bondage to sin and Satan. But you and I, we've been freed by a power. What power? God's power. And who? And the person of Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. So you're, you and I, when we're having fellowship with God, they don't even know it, but we're manifesting God's power in their presence when we're having fellowship with God. When we're applying God's word in our lives, where it's at school, in our jobs, with our neighbors, or relationships with people, and the non-Christian, they're, they're actually being witness to where they, the manifestation of God's power in your life. <laughs> Pretty exciting. So a comparison of 2 Timothy 1.5 and Paul's statement here in 2 Timothy 3.15, as we noted last evening, indicates that Timothy's grandmother, Lois, and his mother, Eunice, gave him instruction in the Old Testament and provided him an example of how to walk by faith in the Old Testament scriptures. Timothy's mother and grandmother, as we saw last evening, obeyed Paul's apostolic command in Ephesians 6.4 to bring up children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Fathers and mothers are to train their children by means of the word of God, as we'll see in tomorrow, beginning tomorrow and then next week. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 teaches us the scriptures, Old Testament scriptures are for training in righteousness. Now, as we come to the end of this lesson, we must remember that Paul's apostolic teaching, or in other words, the Old Testament, which he communicated, was consistent with the teaching of the Old Testament because the gospel presents Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises. So as I go back to the Old Testament here, I said to you before, and I, saw, I told you last evening and last week, Paul, Timothy's training in the Old Testament with his mother and grandmother gave him a firm foundation to, for, for uh, coming into contact with Paul's gospel because Paul's gospel was revealing that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the promises of the Old Testament. And thus, what Paul learned with, uh, what Timothy learned with Paul and his apostolic teaching was consistent with what he learned in the Old Testament. Why? Because what Paul taught, which is in our New Testament, about Jesus was the fulfillment of the promises that are found in the Old Testament to God's people. So hold your place. Look at Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 1. Hold your place. Look at Romans 1 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which gospel he promised before... Who's the subject of the gospel? Jesus Christ. Watch, he's going to tell you that. Which he promised beforehand, which gospel, God promised beforehand through his prophets, that's the Old Testament prophets, in the Holy Scriptures. What are the Holy Scriptures there? The Old Testament. He's saying the gospel... God promised, this gospel, God promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament. So Paul, you can see this in Paul's writings, especially when you're dealing with Judaism and the Judaizers. The gospel, his gospel was consistent with the Old Testament. So Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which gospel he, God the Father promised beforehand in the Old Testament, through his prophets in the Holy, Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament, concerning his son, the Gospels concerning his son, Jesus Christ, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, according to his human nature, he was a descendant of David, who, Jesus Christ, was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection demonstrated that he was who he claimed to be, the Son of God. According to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So notice the gospel and its relationship to the Old Testament. 
the gospel of Jesus Christ was promised in the Old Testament scriptures. And uh, so, go back to 2 Timothy. Go back to 2 Timothy. Chapter 3, verse 15. So the gospel's presentation of the character and nature of God is consistent with that of the Old Testament. If you think about it, obviously. The emphasis upon faith in God's word in the Old Testament is consistent with the gospel, the teaching of Jesus and his apostles. They taught, like the Old Testament, the importance of faith. The teaching in the Old Testament that, a belief, that the believer is to love God with their entire being and neighbor as oneself is consistent with that of the teaching of, the, of Jesus and the apostles since they affirmed this teaching. We just saw that in Romans 13.10. Also, the Old Testament scriptures provide many examples where God has delivered his people from adversity and persecution as a result of their exercising faith in him, which would be very helpful, as I know, noted earlier, it would be very helpful for Timothy since he was facing persecution and undeserved suffering because of remaining faithful to Paul's apostolic teaching. And it would be very important because if Timothy wants to experience his salvation, his deliverance from sin and Satan, faith is going to, he's going to need to exercise faith. And what particular doctrine? You're crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ, Timothy. Appropriate by faith your position in Christ. What would that entail? Consider yourself dead to the sin nature and alive to God, Romans 6, 11, and 12. And present the members of your bodies as, inter, as instruments of righteousness rather than unrighteousness. So, we see that the relationship, the, script, the Old Testament scriptures, would, and they, it's, this is true for us too. This is great about this lesson with, about Timothy. But it's so applicable to us because the Old Testament gives us many examples of faith. Because Paul's talking about Timothy. You need to, if you want to experience this salvation, you've got to exercise faith. Now, in the Old Testament... There are many examples where God's people, like as I mentioned before, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, David, they exercised faith in God to what? In order to appropriate God's power, and God's power delivered them for whatever adversity there was. Now, Paul's talking about a, a deliverance that's spiritual in 2 Timothy 3.15. And many of the examples that we see in the Old Testament are in the natural realm, but they're also... They're also in the spiritual realm as well in the Old Testament. Now, in 2 Timothy 3.15, if you look at 2 Timothy 3.14 in my translation, please. Bring out a few things here and we'll wrap this up. 2 Timothy 3.14, you, however, Timothy, in contrast to them, the apostate pastor teaches in their day, his day, Continue to make it your habit of conforming to the standard of those things, those teachings, which you have learned through instruction and observation. Listening to me, your mother and your grandmother, and, and watching our, our example and practicing our teaching. Indeed, you have become convinced, become convinced of these things because you certainly know from whom you have learned through instruction and observation. Yes, because from childhood, you certainly know the Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for the purpose of experiencing salvation by means of faith and your union and identification with the Christ who is Jesus. So, in 2 Timothy 3.15, we can see that Paul presents the means by which Timothy could experience salvation or deliverance from sin and Satan. It was by means of faith or appropriating by faith his union and identification with Christ and his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session. Therefore, faith is used here in an active sense, referring to Timothy's post-conversion faith in the word of God, and specifically the Old Testament and Paul's apostolic teaching, since Timothy was already declared justified through faith in Jesus Christ. So the word faith there speaks of Timothy's post-conversion faith after he became a Christian through faith. He's talking about his post-conversion faith in the word of God, or in other words, his faith in the Spirit's teaching that is revealed through the communication of the word of God, whether it be, it be the teaching the Old Testament or the gospel. Hold on, go back to Romans. Hold your place. Go back to Romans quickly. Go to Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 16. Romans 1, 16. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it is the power of God for salvation. Everything I'm talking about this evening, it's right there. 
to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Look, he says, from faith to faith. As it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. As I said earlier, a non-Christian is not a righteous person, a righteous man. He doesn't have imputed righteousness. How do you get imputed righteousness? Faith in Jesus Christ, justification. The minute you trusted in Jesus as your Savior, as a non-believer, you became a Christian, you had faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, and the Father imputed his son's righteousness to you, and he saw it in you and declared you justified. I accept you because of Christ's righteousness in you. So that, that's a, then now you're a righteous person positionally. Now we need to exercise faith in the word of God if we're going to experience the fact that we're righteous. So, for, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Live by faith. Now go back to 2 Timothy 3.15. So when Paul talks about faith in 2 Timothy 3.15, he's speaking of Timothy's post-conversion faith in the word of God. It does not refer to saving faith or justifying faith in Jesus Christ for eternal salvation, but rather it's talking about the Christian's faith in the word of God after their conversion, since in context, Paul is speaking of Timothy who is already experiencing, it's speaking of Timothy experiencing his salvation after his conversion. Timothy's already saved. I mean, he's already a part of God's family. I mean, heck, he's a teacher. So Paul's emphasizing here in 2 Timothy 3.15, he's emphasizing with Timothy that in order, and it's also the Spirit is emphasizing with us here, now, with this teaching here. He's emphasizing with Timothy that in order for him to experience salvation or deliverance from sin, Satan, his cosmic system, the object of his faith must be his union and identification with Jesus Christ and his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session. He must appropriate this deliverance by appropriating by faith his union and identification with Christ. Uh, you don't have to hold your place. Go back to Romans again. I want to show you this again. Look at Romans 6. I could show it to you in a couple of places, but we'll go to Romans 6. Look at verse 1. Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that, so that grace may increase? And of course, he's talking about, he's alluding to the, his critics who say, oh, Timothy, Paul, you're teaching grace. No law. We're not under the law, so there's no law, so we can live without any old way we want. So that's, therefore, you're giving us a license to sin. No. May it never be. How shall we who die to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death. Meaning, all those who are baptized means identify with Christ, have been identified with his death. Now, what does that mean? God says, when, you di when Christ died, I consider you to have died because you're under his headship. I look at the human race under two men, the first Adam and the last Adam. You're under the last Adam through your faith in him. So then he says in verse 4, therefore... We've been buried with him. If we, de if we died with him, then we buried with him. Through baptism, the baptism of the Spirit, into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life, experiencing our salvation. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, and the first class condition implies that, yeah, we have. Certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, a guarantee of a resurrection body. Knowing this, now not, he's talking there, don't miss this, he's talking about deliverance from sin. Salvation in relation to sin. Knowing this, verse 6, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. When it says done away with, as we studied it when we back and we did Romans, it means to be rendered inoperative. For he who has died is freed from sin. So we're freed from sin. We die. That means we've died to the sin nature through our identification with Christ and his death. We, the sin has no power over us. We sin because we're walking back into slavery again to the sin nature. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with uh, Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, because 
Christ does this and he lives dedicated to God, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin. Why? Because you've died to sin with your identification with Christ and his death and burial. But alive to God in Christ Jesus. Why? Because you're raised with Christ through the baptism of the Spirit. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, the sin nature, resulting in death, loss of fellowship with God, or of obedience, resulting in righteousness, experiencing the righteousness of God. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you become obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present the members of your body as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. So you experience your sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were freed in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you were now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from sin, there's your salvation. And slave to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That chapter, Paul's telling us that's how you experience your salvation that's how you experience your sanctification and with and by appropriating by faith your union and identification with christ and that's what timothy would know timothy knew all this teaching obviously so when he talks to timothy in second timothy three fifteen, that the old testament scriptures give you uh, give you wisdom so that so you can uh, what, what is the translation there second to give you wisdom for the purpose of experiencing salvation by means of faith in your union identification with Jesus Christ who is Jesus. So the Old Testament scriptures give them examples of faith where Old Testament uh, characters like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego appropriated the power of God because they had faith in God. So he's saying, Timothy, you got those examples of the Old Testament that you know. Now you have examples to follow. Of how you, now you have to appropriate your salvation, your deliverance from sin and Satan, appropriate by faith by exercising faith, appropriating by faith your union and identification with Jesus Christ and experiencing the power of God and the deliverance of God from sin and Satan. That's why it, this is a fantastic passage about uh, in, in experiencing our salvation now and in time. We don't have to wait till the rapture of the church. We can experience it now and bring glory to God. And that's what he wanted Tim, uh, Timothy to do. Well, let's wrap this study up uh, and let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this lesson would be a blessing to your people. We thank you for everyone here this evening. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.